This is Deborah Johnson for Women at Halftime, and I'm passionate about helping women use their untapped skills, resources, and talents to create their ideal work and lifestyle, making a difference in their second half. Very, very happy to be back with another week of Women at Halftime podcast. And I have such a great, great uh, uh, subject today, uh, interviewing Chris Kelso, Silence Your Inner Critic um, in Overcoming the Imposter Syndrome. Oh, wow. And you're probably going, what is the imposter syndrome? Oh, or else you're going, oh, I have that. So <laughs> we're going to talk through that. He just came out with a new book and I'm I'm so excited. He's kind of a new friend. So I'm, I'm just so excited about this. Um, as this comes out, I'm starting to put out promotion for a brand new book, which is The Summit. It's an allegory, very different from anything I've written. This is my fifth book. Um, and the, the Summit, Journey to Hero Mountain. So much fun to write. I think it will be so much fun to read. Uh, it's in. It's starting to be in pre-release. I guess of. Uh, I will make that available by August. But make sure you check out HeroMountainSummit.com. You can see some information and and the artwork and all of that for it. it it's going to be a lot of fun and a great gift book as well. So um, you can always reach me also on my Facebook page Deborah Johnson. So I do a lot of Facebook lives. So, but I'm going to get right to this. Because um, Chris, say hello to everybody. <laughs> hello to everyone in Deborah Johnson and Women at Halftime Land. Yes, yes. And, and I always love this little disclosure. If you're um, a gentleman, a man listening to this, it's okay. I have a lot That's of right. you listening. <laughs> yes. We're allowed to be here. We're, we're okay. <laughs> And a lot of you listen and think, oh, I really relate to that. So, and it's good. It's good. We both, now I, I learned, Chris, that you you have three sons. I had three sons and yes. they go through the same stuff. So, yes, <laughs> anyway. yes. That's, yeah. a, that's a fun uh, stage of raising three boys. It really, really is. Lots of testosterone, I tell you. Lots of, <laughs> lots of <laughs> socks, as I say. <laughs> yep, yep. It's just, it's an interesting life. So, well, uh, Chris, you have quite the background. I love it that you've uh, you've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs and business owners, and, you know, leadership teams and all of this. And and um, so you've you've really, you're, uh, you're like an executive coach that you are a leadership coach, you call yourself. And yes. uh, you're also a contributing writer. So you quite arrived for a number of different publications. So you've got a nice yeah. little background. I'll put links in. There's always an article that comes out with every, uh, every show. And so you want to mm -hmm. make sure that you, you look at that. So, um, but why don't you give us a little bit of your background and um, explain this imposter syndrome, where that came from, Chris? Sure. I am. Uh, so, so my career has been a twisty, turny, uh, not clean, straightforward path of learning and exploring and really trying a lot of different things. I was a software developer many years ago, uh -huh. uh, then became an entrepreneur, founded and ran two different companies and uh, and did a lot of consulting work with private equity firms and uh, even some large Fortune 50 organizations at certain times. And as you mentioned, for the last four or five years, I've been working as an executive coach, largely with entrepreneurs and business owners and their leadership teams. And this topic of imposter syndrome, it, it first came up for me uh, several years ago when in a conversation with another executive coach, uh, and I've had several coaches myself through my career, um, I learned about this thing called imposter syndrome. And, and when I started to study it a little bit and read about it, I had this immediate, uh, oh my goodness, now I have a name for that thing, that, uh -huh. that voice in my head that I've had for so long because I have experienced imposter syndrome at many points in my career, in particular, when I tried to do something new or different, when I started my first company, when I started consulting with you know, these large fortune 50 organizations. And when I got into working with investors and private equity and spaces that I wasn't, you know, formally educated or deeply familiar with, uh, but began to dive in and really help and, and offer some things to these groups. And, but I didn't have a name for it. And I didn't, 
I, I really thought I was the only one. Like it was just me. It was just my own feeling of uh, inadequacy or insecurity. So for, for anyone listening who doesn't know what imposter syndrome is, I'll define it really quickly. It's the, the term was coined in the 1970s, actually. This is not a new thing, but it's it refers to a pattern of thinking where a person systematically doubts their own success and their own achievements. And what, what tends to happen is we overvalue the accomplishments of other people and we undervalue our own accomplishments. And so, you know, I can look at uh, Deborah as a as a speaker and an author and an entrepreneur, and I can say, well, Deborah's success is because she's really smart and savvy, and she knows how to make all the right moves, and she has a plan, and she executes it well, and she just really seems to know what she's doing. Whereas my success as an author, a speaker, a coach, whatever has, boy, it sure has involved a lot of luck and timing. <laughs> and man, I, I've really made a lot of mistakes along the way and just somehow managed to figure out a way through it. And, um, but a lot of the time I, I really don't feel like I know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of learning on the fly and making it up as I go. And as I mentioned earlier, my career has sort of been driven by a curiosity and a passion to learn things and try things, but that has resulted in me often being in a place of, I am in over my head. I don't know what I'm doing. I am just figuring it out on the fly. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like everyone else seems to know what they're doing. And maybe I'm the only one who doesn't. Wow. But the reality is many of us feel that way. And I'm sure your listeners right now are identifying on, oh, yes, I've been there. Um, (laughs) Some studies say that up to 70 or 80% of the population at some point in their career experiences imposter syndrome. And it tends to be more prevalent among high achievers. Yes. So among entrepreneurs and driven executives, people that are innovative, people that are pushing the boundaries for that very reason that you're pushing yourself, you're driving yourself and you're trying new things, you're going to find yourself periodically in a place where you say, how did I get here? And, <laughs> and, and do I really deserve to be here? Or is this all just a fluke? Yeah. I am so glad you mentioned that because I wrote in my notes because this, you know, new book I have coming out is very, it, it approaches a little bit of this too, the fear and the, uh, you know, the self doubt, Uh, but it really does not matter what level you're at. It does not matter. We, we see, and I've been in the entertainment business for a a number of years. You see these gorgeous people, extremely talented, and they're going to go, you know, after the gig, well, do you think we fooled them today? I mean, it's just, you know, this, Yes. you know how good you are, but it doesn't matter of the level. And those sort of thoughts do, and they come either now and then, or if we dwell on them. And that kind of mm-hmm. comes to, you know, a, another a little question here. Can you really silence that inner critic? Or what are some of those ways that you do? I'm sure you approach that in your book. And I'm going to put a link in the, the show notes on this. But it, it's, can you, can you shut yeah. that down? How do you do that? The, the book is called Overcoming the Imposter, and, and the, the name was not chosen randomly or flippantly. It's very intentionally about a journey of overcoming. Um, and and you, you, know, you don't reach a point in life necessarily where you've fought that battle and you've won it and it's done and over with. Mm-hmm. Now, you can overcome in certain areas and build the confidence to the point that you feel like, yeah, I know that backwards and forwards and I've got it. And I am, you know, definitively an expert in that area. But again, if you're the type of person who is pushing yourself, who's learning, who's trying new things, then you're going to, even if you sort of beat the imposter, which is what I call that voice, that inner critic Mm -hmm. in your head, that that voice that says, you don't know what you're doing. You don't measure up. You're not good enough. You're going to fail here. If you beat that voice in one area, but then you go and attempt something new, you're going to encounter it again. It's going to come back and try to, to convince you that, well, this is the time that you are in over your head and you don't know what you're doing. And you're because you're in completely new territory. And I experienced that while writing this book. So oh, yeah. this is my first book. I'm, I'm a first time author. And so I was learning a ton about publishing and about the book writing process. I hired a great coach. I had a wonderful publisher, lots of really bright people around me. 
but boy, there were moments when I thought, what in the world am I doing writing a book? What, <laughs> how, what, I am not an author. I'm not a, I don't know this. And then the fact that I was wrestling with imposter syndrome while writing a book about imposter syndrome made me feel like an imposter. <laughs> and so I had to, I had to battle the feeling that I wasn't qualified to write this book simply because I was feeling insecure about being qualified to write this book. <laughs> and so it becomes this self-reinforcing, you know, thought process. And fortunately, I have studied and I've interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs and innovators and learned some of the techniques that I used on myself mm -hmm. to overcome those feelings of self-doubt and to, to reframe my situation in a really productive way. Oh, cool. We're going to get to some of those techniques. I'm, I'm sure everybody's sitting at the edge of their seat now. Oh, what are those? What are those? And just to give you a little clue, it doesn't matter how many books you've written, you can still go through it. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Thinking, what am I doing writing another book? I guess. Yes. You know? Well, one it's of the just... great quotes that I read in my study was author Maya Angelou, uh -huh. who said, I think it was after her 11th book, uh -huh. and she had a lot of successful books. She said, after publishing that 11th book, she said, oh, this is the one. This is this is the time they're going to figure me out yes. that I've been running a scam on everybody that I don't know what I'm doing. Like <laughs> the jig is up any minute now. And she said she feels that way every time she publishes a book. So again, it can come up time and time again. Yeah. Um, and it's not a sign that you're weak or inferior or that you really don't know what you're doing. In fact, sometimes it's just a sign of uh, the right level of humility and self-reflection you know, that you're not egotistical and, and too far in the opposite direction. Right. And, and I think um, one of the reasons for failure is overconfidence. <laughs> and so we yes. have to realize, you know, coming toward, you know, something new, and especially, I mean, you know, I hired the best people I can. And so I hired a, a great editor. So of course you're going to see all of these, you know, cross outs and, you know, all this stuff right. on your work yeah. and you're, you're looking yeah. at it. And, and I kind of looked at my husband and I said, what am I doing writing another book? <laughs> yep. But that's what I paid for. That's what I need. And that's what we yes. all need is we have to have that input and uh, really, really important. So, um, and you've covered a little bit of my next little question was your background, how you've experienced imposter syndrome, because it's exactly as you're doing something. But I think the important uh, point here is that you were moving ahead and, and yes. you didn't say, no, I can't do it. Bury your head in the sand. Stay stuck. You didn't do that. So uh, you, you moved uh, ahead on that. So uh, anyway, I'm going to, I want to be able to talk about a couple of those steps, but let's talk about this comparison trap first yes. and the dangers of that. Cause that's a big one too. Yeah. I had, I had several really eye-opening revelations as I was sort of doing the research and compiling the stories and preparing for this book, this material. And one of them was recognizing that, um, Anytime I'm comparing myself to another person, almost 100% of the time, I won't say never, but almost 100% of the time, uh, I don't know their full story. I don't know the truth and the reality of their situation. And so I'm comparing the reality of my own life to a usually polished and filtered version mm -hmm. of someone else's life. Yes. And I've heard it compared to, you know, comparing yourself when you roll out of bed to someone else as they walk out their front door yes. or, you know, yes. comparing your, the, the reality of your struggles and learning and failures and the, the, the process of success to yes. just the end result of someone else's success. You see right. their victories, you see their accolades, you see their awards, you see the, the spotlight and social media, of course, can exacerbate this problem of we get a highlight reel of everyone else's life and we compare that to our day to day. And it just seems like we're falling behind. But the comparison trap is that anytime you're making that comparison and you're trying to judge yourself mm -hmm. against someone else, mm -hmm. it's a trap. It's always going to result in you feeling inferior, behind, or under the under the gun, and it's not fair to you. Now, that's not at all to say that we don't learn from other people or that we don't admire and aspire to the things we see other people accomplishing. We can learn a lot from others. We just can't put ourselves in the trap of unfairly comparing that reality of our life to a very polished, filtered, 
uh, external view of someone else's. And, and social media has just been so harmful in this, I think, because, you know, there's, you can buy all of this stuff that'll make you look so good. They will enhance your appearance. It'll enhance, you know, some sort of filter on all your pictures. It'll be color coordinated. You just look so amazing to everyone. Right. Perfect. And then you're going, you know, I just did this Facebook live or I did a, you know, uh, an Instagram reel and I look like, I'm 10 years older than I am. And, and <laughs> like, look what I was yes. wearing. And it's, oh, my, yeah. you know, and you start doing and then and then you don't put it out because you think, oh, I can't come, you know. So it, right. it's it that is the fallacy. And I think a lot of people have had to get over that, especially during the years of the shut, year of year, it feels like years now of, of yes, these shutdowns. Yes. <laughs> we all know that. But uh, we've had to get over a lot of that and just say, you know what? This is who it is. And and I've kind of changed some of my strategy as well, just to be, you know, in front of that camera being more authentic because people need to see the real. They yeah. need to see, and what I love to compare this to is somebody singing the national anthem. It is the, uh, some of these pop artists, they're just, they do this style where they're singing five notes, you know, over and over and they've got this stuff. But then you see, like they show up at a game, you go, is that that person? They can really sing? Really? Yeah. With all the training they had. And it puts this in perspective, like, oh, there's real talent there. I mean, a lot of times we don't see the real talent because it's hidden in this sort of visual. And so we are doing ourselves harm as well if we yeah. put on that sort of facade. So, and we feel like we have to, you know, keep up with everyone else. And I, I'm big on uniqueness. And and when you're talking about yes. comparison trap, I have a name for that too, is this head trash we get into. So, but that's a whole other, but you really do. You really do. So. It is, it is. And so I, I think we can learn from other people but we should benchmark and measure ourselves against ourselves. Yes. Right. If I'm making progress toward my goals, if I'm living in my calling and my purpose, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pursuing what I've been given to do, I'm on my journey. And as long as I'm taking steps forward on that journey, I'm successful and I'm making progress. And I can't compare my journey to someone else's journey because it's it's a different road. It's a different path. And there may be similarities and there may be learnings I can take from them. But right. the comparison, the, the, the valuation judging me against someone else is where we fall into a trap and it, and it goes really wrong for us. And, and I love that, that word trap that you use, trap. Yeah, <laughs> it really it is, is a trap. It really is. And it keeps people stuck. You know, they're locked, locked, locked down. It does. Down. Yeah. It, it, it absolutely does. You, you, you get insecure. And so then your performance is hampered by it. So you, you do worse or you slow down and then you feel even worse about yourself because other yes. people are moving forward and compared. <laughs> so it is a trap and it's a, it can be a downward spiral if you let it take over your thinking. Right. Right. Well, you mentioned something a little earlier um, that I really wanted to kind of um, launch out on, on some of the steps people can take yeah. to overcome this because you've done all of these interviews and which is so very valuable. When I look for sources, I look for actual people that have done the research, not just yes. like some sort of like, where did you get that statistic? And my husband's been in finance for years and says, you can make up almost any number. <laughs> you just yes. make them up. Well, you know, 73 <laughs> Three percent of all statistics are made up on the spot. Yeah, you would know that. I love this <laughs> the fact that you were a software developer. And, and, and I love, you know, yes. I, I call myself a nerd as well. So a fellow nerd. So this is good. So <laughs> I love yeah. statistics, real statistics. Um, so give us a, a couple of those clues, because I want people to walk away with saying, wow, I could apply that, you know, little little baby steps, maybe. Yeah. So, so several of the things that you need to do are, are changes in your mindset, changes mm -hmm. in how you think, right? And there, there are changes in the way you think that translate to changes in behavior and actions. Mm -hmm. But the, the thought process, the, the, I'll give you a couple of big ones. One of them is to reframe failure mm -hmm. as learning. And what yeah. I mean by that is that if people think that failure is the opposite of success, and in fact, failure is part of the process of success. Mm -hmm. And I give dozens of examples in my book um, about people that failed their way to success, people that 
that you've heard of people, famous people, people that we admire who had big failures in their career. Um, Walt Disney's first two studios, creative businesses failed. One of them went bankrupt after two years. His first one failed after a month, Mm. but he went on to create the company we've all heard of (laughs) that is his namesake, Disney World and Disney. And um, Babe Ruth was known as the Sultan of SWAT because he held home run records and RBI records. And he's considered one of the greatest baseball players of all kind, all time. But his other nickname was the King of Strikeouts. Mm-hmm. Right. And his, his career total of 1,330 strikeouts was a major league baseball record for 30 years. Mm-hmm. And it was then beaten by Mickey Mantle. Wow. So these guys who we think of as heavy hitters, as winners, mm-hmm. they also held the record for the most failures, the most strikeouts, the most failures at the plate, but they didn't see them that way because every time they struck out, they were learning something about that pitcher and his tendencies and how they could do better. And they used that learning to make it to the next home run. And so the big change in mindset is thinking about failure as a learning process. And I have a a personal mantra that I've developed that I remind myself of regularly, which is failure is only truly failure if you learn nothing. Mm. And so in anything that I attempt to do in any risk that I take or any venture that I uh, embark on, I will tell myself there's two outcomes possible here. I'm either going to succeed or I'm going to learn. And as long as I get one of those two things, I'm doing well and I'm making progress moving forward. So by reframing failure as learning, you remove the fear of failure, which is a big part of what under what underlies imposter syndrome is the fear of failure and the fear, especially the fear of failure in public. Right. And if I make a mistake, people are going to see me as a failure and that's going to hold me back. Yes. And in fact, the failures often are the stepping stones we build upon the foundational components that build our success because there's so much opportunity to learn there. Yeah, you really do. You learn so much through, through failure. You learn more through failure almost than, than success. Because Absolutely. You, yeah. Yeah. You, you really do. But it's, but it's that fear of like, of looking stupid or, you know, letting people down or, you know, yeah. uh, of losing money, of losing, uh, you know, time, all of those things. But, you know, there's a certain amount of risk. You just have to, you have to know how much you can risk and then just, you know, go forward right. too with, uh, depends on, on what you're, you're failing in. So that is a great one. I love that to reframe failure. Well, is there one, is there another, I mean, that's a real mindset. Is there another little clue, but so much depends on your mindset on this whole thing, because that's what that is. That that just works on that, on your mind saying, you know, I'm not good enough or I can't, you know, I'm, you know, do I have to keep fooling people or whatever? So, yeah, well, there's, there's another shift in mindset that goes kind of hand in hand with that um, is how you think about vulnerability Mm. imposter syndrome at the core is the, it's the fear of vulnerability. It's the fear of people figuring out who and what you really are. And that if they do, you're going to fall short Mm -hmm. and, and you're going to be exposed as a fraud or an imposter or uh, as not, you know, what they thought you are. Mm -hmm. And, but what I have learned is that the cure for imposter syndrome is vulnerability Mm -hmm. that when you open up, And when you get honest with people and it would take us far longer than your show has time for to really dig in and unpack this. But uh, I share several stories and examples of, of times that I have kind of taken a risk and opened up and exposed myself, my weaknesses, my fears have talked about my struggles and it completely changed the conversation in the room. It completely changed a relationship. It completely changed the dynamic. And when you open up and get vulnerable, you think that you're going to erode trust. You think people are going to trust you less, but you actually build trust. Mm. People trust leaders more who are authentic and vulnerable than they do leaders who feign perfection, who look like they've got it all together, who never let them see you sweat, so to speak. Mm. And so I have learned to not only appreciate vulnerability and and see how it is valuable and it it works for me not against me mm-hmm. but actually even to use it as a as a superpower as a weapon as a tool 
to change the dynamic of an organization, of a conversation, of a group of people. Uh, and by doing that, by leaning into it and looking for opportunities to be vulnerable, I remove the primary tool of the imposter, of that inner critic, who is saying to me, if, if, if you let them know who you really are, they're going to lose respect. Well, guess what? If I just do that and then they don't lose respect, I no longer fear that. Yes. I no longer have that fear. So I, I lean into the fear, which it goes again, hand in hand with removing the fear of failure from the equation. If I don't feel failure and I don't feel vulnerability, then there is nowhere for that inner critic to go to try to convince me that I'm at risk. Right. It's like you've removed the biggest monster. Yeah, you yeah. know, it, yeah. if you're, you know, and it's, uh, I've heard this as well, uh, for those that take even more risks. And once you're not, and it must have been, you know, some of the the past, like the evil Knievels and all those, once you're not afraid of dying, you take, you know, you take all of these, which might That's be right. stupid <laughs> in some respects. But if you've, if you've taken away the biggest fear and just in and being able to meet that there's a lot of other things in life that that you can be yes. free, freed up just freed it, it up frees to you live. so much yeah. yeah and that freedom is what we all desire in pursuing you know people are so afraid of just failing they're not starting their new businesses or they're not you know it's like well you know i just can't really you know i know i can't afford that right now well start yeah. something small on the side oh i really don't have time you have a lot more time than you think oh my goodness you have a lot more time yes you know? that's right yeah so yeah, I think that's a great one, Chris. Thank you so much. So you've, you you know, with this reframe failure and this vulnerability, um, and just just kind of meeting that, you know, head on. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And th- these are these are things that are simple, but mm-hmm. simple is not easy. No, no. And so I don't want to, you know, paint the picture that, oh, it's just, just change how you think about failure and boom, you're good, <laughs> right? It's, this is a muscle that you have to exercise. This is a, a, a skill that you have to develop. It's a, it's a, it's like any hard thing. It's hard at first, but it gets easier the more you do it. So you have to, you have to pump those muscles. You have to work on that. You have to look for opportunities where failure is a, is a distinct possibility and lean into it. Mm-hmm. And then come out on the other side, realizing that the failure wasn't as bad as you thought and that you actually took something great away from it. Right. And that makes it easier the next time you're going to encounter failure or you're going to take a risk. So these are these are changes that seem really simple and cliche even, but mm-hmm. it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to build them into disciplines where they they really truly become a part of how you think. And I loved the the way you put this. It's a muscle you have to exercise because even when you exercise regularly, which I do, I'm an early morning person. I get up and like send my body to the gym. <laughs> yeah. I'm not really, I'm not really, a, I don't call myself a morning person, but I guess, you know, because I've gotten up for so many years with the cows, whatever, um, it, bright and early, but the, um, that discipline, but there are mornings that, you know, I think, you know, this should be a lot easier. (laughs) It just should be so much easier. I'm in shape and it's so hard. And I think our mindset is the same way as we, we meet that again, thinking, "Ah, I already, I already kind of went through this. Shouldn't this be easier? Shouldn't this be easy? Yeah. Yeah. I think we've all been, I think we've been, misled by some of these cliches, like, you know, that it takes 21 days to form a habit. Oh yeah. There's a lot of science that shows that, that, that it takes a lot longer to that than that to really ingrain something in you to the point that it's natural, that it comes easy, right? Maybe it takes 21 days to sort of get over the hump and get into a routine, but to get to the point that it just happens automatically Right. can take longer than that. And you have to continue to work at it. You have to push through the pain. It does get easier. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't flip from hard to easy. No. <laughs> this is not a binary <laughs> thing, right? It, it's a gradual progression until yeah. one day you look up and you've been getting up and exercising every morning for three or four years. And it's, yeah. it is just sort of a natural part of who you are. And you say, well, yeah, this is not that hard because I've just been doing it for so long. Yeah. But that didn't happen after three weeks, did it? No. And I loved you use that term. It's not just because yeah, the software engineer, the binary, um, because yes. binary is just zeros and ones. 
but but oh you put them in a different order they're totally different <laughs> so, yes yes yeah and but the but the routine it is very very important we might feel different mm. our feelings will just they have to kind of follow sometimes but yes. you just but getting into that that routine i think that's a really really important point here so uh, to be uh, coming out of this. And those are some just really great suggestions on mindset because it really deals all of this. It's like, this is just all mindset with us, with the, with that imposter. So, it is one of the worst things about imposter syndrome is that it's just totally a mental game. Yeah. 90% of it is in your head. And, yeah. and it's things, even the things that are, that you think are coming from other people are mostly your assumptions about what other people think of you. Wow. And so it is all a mental battle. And mm. that's why it's so important to recognize it and to counteract, to, to, to take actions and make decisions differently because no one else can solve this problem for you. You've right. got to have the information and make the choices to think differently because the battle is between your ears. Yeah. And, and uh, right between your ears, it's a lot, you know... <laughs> It's, it's either close or it's far. So yes. uh, anyway, that's a really, really great point. I usually try to kind of sum this up with a couple points, but I think you gave us, you know, such good points of um, reframing failure and um, meeting this uh, vulnerability. Was there anything else that you wanted to just leave uh, our listeners with as far as this imposter, if they're saying, oh, that just sounds too hard or like, how do, what do I do first? Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to remind everyone that um, I mentioned early on that this is tends to be more prevalent among high achievers. Mm. And so if you're feeling like you're in over your head, if you feel like a fraud, if you have those moments of insecurity, that's actually a sign that you're doing something great. Mm. It's a sign that you're uh, pushing yourself, that you're stretching, that you're growing. I have learned to recognize that feeling of being in over my head, of feeling like a fraud as a signal that I'm growing and stretching. And one of the aha moments I had in, in cataloging and compiling all the content for this book, I took a long look over my career and my history, and I recognized that the times I felt the most insecure Mm -hmm. were the most pivotal moments of my career. Mm. It was the times that I was trying something new, that I was surrounded by people that intimidated me because they were so smart and so mm -hmm. successful and that I felt inferior. I felt like I didn't belong, but there were really great things happening. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned to see that, to, to, to recognize that feeling as actually a great sign and to lean into those moments when I feel insecure. And once you recognize that pattern, then it really does change. It, it doesn't mean you don't feel insecure. It doesn't mean you don't ever feel like you're in over your head, but, but you begin to recognize that ah, there's good stuff on the other side of this. And I've got to push forward rather than what I feel like doing, which is to pull back. Yes. Oh, really, really great. I think that's, that is so very, very, very valuable. So uh, really great point. I hope everyone takes the time to, to read your book. I've really been into audiobooks as well. So you've had it, uh, is it available on audiobook as well? Or We don't have an audiobook out yet. There okay. will probably be a launch of an audiobook coming in the future, but it's not available today. So you're going to have to either get the hardcover or uh, go for the digital Kindle version. Okay. Well, they can, they can do that as well. So how can people contact you or uh, you would know what I loved you um, because we've communicated, you have one of the greatest reading book lists on your website. It was wonderful. Oh, so thank you. Link there too. Yeah. And I love to read uh, prolific reader. So uh, I just thought it was very valuable because you put little reviews on there as well, but how can people contact you? Yeah, I'm easy to find. If you remember, my name starts with a K. It's K-R-I-S-K-E-L-S-O, Chris Kelso. So I'm at chriskelso.com. And that's where, as you mentioned, Deborah, I have a reading list that I've specifically compiled for entrepreneurs. It's just all the, of the hundreds of business books I've read, it's the one that I find myself recommending over and over and over. Good, and uh, so at chriskelso.com, you can read a lot about me there. I'm active on several social media channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter and Instagram. Um, and you can specifically find out about the book at overcomingtheimposter.com. Oh, cool. Uh, that's the website yeah. for the book. And people can download a free sample chapter of the book there if they are 
you know, not sure if they really want to commit to the book or if this is for them, is it really me? Um, go grab a sample chapter for free. It's my gift to you and, and you can check it out and, and see if it's worth your time to invest in. Perfect. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. I hope everybody does that. So Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, this has been fun. We we met kind of recently in one of our speaking groups, actually, uh, yes. you know, creating a new keynote and uh, as I've been working on um, as well. And so uh, it was just a pleasure. I loved your message and I've heard your message uh, firsthand. So it's just a really strong one. So I really wanted my audience to hear that. So um, for everyone tuning in, thank you so much. You can always reach me, Deborah Johnson, at women at halftime.com. Uh, that's our podcast page. Uh, and you can uh, get, I've got a number of websites, goalsforyourlife.com, DJ Works Music, Deborah Johnson Speaker, uh, a lot of them. So uh, plenty of stuff to keep you plenty busy if you, if you are so inclined. Next week, I am be speaking on how your core values can affect your happiness. And uh, it's a really great subject, core values affecting your happiness. And as Chris talked a little bit uh, with our purpose today, um, but some of our core values is really related to our purpose in life. And so, um, and happiness, it, people talk a lot about happiness, but really what is true happiness and what is true joy? It really comes from the soul. So uh, make sure you tune in and you can contact me at any time. Love to hear from you. Would love you to share this. Uh, the reason I do it is people enjoy and are getting uh, just a, a lot of benefit from some of the things we cover. So please share it and the links to this these episodes, uh, these shows and subscribe. And I will look forward to seeing you next time. And bye for now. Thank you for joining us on Women at Halftime. Visit goalsforyourlife.com or womenathalftime.com for many more resources, downloads and programs or to get in touch with me. I'd love it if you leave me a review and tell your friends. So until next time, this is Deborah Johnson signing off.